to, to start with, I wanted to just revisit what we talked about a lot last week um, with the way that Genesis 3 and the temptation begins um, with casting doubt on what God has really said. That uh, this, this is Satan's sort of uh, key moment. Did God really say? And um, we, we looked at... Um, Briefly at Proverbs 30 and Revelation 22, I think I took them, there's plenty, you have last week's sheet, um, about you know the, the warning not to add to or subtract from God's word. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking that um, a lot of times we hear things that sound Christian. Um, they maybe even sound biblical, um, but, but they're really not. Um, which is, is why I, I find myself being kind of a stinker around um, some things. Like, for example, um, you, you've, I've been your pastor long enough, you know I'm kind of a stinker around Christmas. <laughs> and, and just the way that um, cultural mythology has obscured um, what the Bible actually says. And, the, you know, with Christmas, a lot of it's kind of harmless. But it's an indication that sometimes we listen to other voices more than we listen to what the scripture actually says in careful reading of the scriptural text. Um, I'm the same way with angels. Again, I've been your pastor long enough. You've heard me rant about how we talk about angels and just that the whole biblical teaching of angels doesn't always have a lot to do with, um, with what's out there in the popular culture. Um, so... Here's some other things that we hear, and we think it's biblical wisdom, but, but it's really not. Uh, we hear things like everything happens for a reason. Um, I dare you to find that in the Bible. Everything happens for a reason. And, and maybe it's, it's sort of pious thinking from a God who knows all and therefore must have a reason for everything that happens. But it also pretty willfully ignores the third petition of the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in the catechism, when, we, when Luther asked the question, what does this mean? He names God's great enemies, the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. Um, it, it's not as if God is unopposed in the world. Um, and you read the book of Job and you say everything happens for a reason. Well, in Job, the only reason that you get is a kind of casual bet between God and Satan. It's pretty, pretty dark stuff, actually. So I think partly it's because we just can't live with the idea of, of randomness. We want to see pattern in everything. I think it's one of the reasons that we have such trouble in our day and age with, with conspiracy theories. You know, it can't just have randomly happened. Some kook couldn't have just shot Kennedy. It had to be the mob or the Cubans or the Russians or somebody. Because we, we, just, we just hate the idea of randomness. Um, you know, we hear things like love the sinner and hate the sin. Again, I challenge you to find that in the Bible. Um, I think there's something to be mined there for good meaning. Um, but sometimes sinner and sin are difficult to distinguish. Uh, my, uh, my daily Bible reading right now is taking me through Jeremiah. Um, and God clearly hates the sin of idolatry in Jeremiah. He's, he's really ticked off through the first half of Jer well, through all of Jeremiah. It's a really depressing book. Um, but there is no distinction between the sin and the sinner. It is the people of Jerusalem who are going to be taken captive. There, there's, there's no distinction made in, in Jeremiah. Uh, oh, I hate the sin, but the sinner is fine. No, um, it is the people of Jerusalem who are going to face terrible, terrible judgment. Um, we say things like, God won't give you more than you can handle, which at least has a certain connection into the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, no, 1 Corinthians 10. Um, you have not beyond, tested beyond what is uh, normal for humans, and God will not test you beyond what you can bear without providing also a way out. Which is interesting because then you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and Paul says, and we were tested, same word as tempted, we were tested beyond anything we could bear. So you have to sort of balance these two things out. Um, any engineers in the crowd? Anybody doing any engineering? 
You know, um, if you have to test something for its limits, what it can bear, you do that because first you have to break it. <laughs> That's the only way you really find out what the limit is. Um, so um, Cal Steinwig uh, is an engineer for Rockwell, and every now and then he'll tell me a story of, of how they, they test something. He showed me a video a couple of years ago. They had had to test something, and they threw like 100,000 amps uh, uh, through this one product and just burst into flame. Like, well, was that a failure? Like, well, no, it's what we expected. But that's how you, how you figure out what the limits are, is sometimes you have to push past the limits and realize, oh, I guess I can't do that. Anyhow, um, th there's all this sort of <sighs> wisdom out there, but it's more like folk wisdom and not really things that the scriptures teach. So on that first point again about how easy it is to warp the word of God, we just have to really be careful with it. And we have to ask every time, what is this and what is it saying? It's, it's every generation's task to come to the scriptures and to, to do the work for themselves to understand uh, what the scriptures are saying. Um, nine times out of ten we find out that um, what the church has always said is exactly what the thing means. It's not a problem. Um, every now and then we come into a really hard passage and sometimes new discoveries in the world around us, uh, or in, the, in the history of, of the world around the scripture, will, will lead us to new kinds of insights. Um, and sometimes we have to say, well, we didn't get that quite right. Um, so just within the Missouri Synod, um, I can still remember a time in my lifetime when women were not allowed to vote at voters' assemblies and they were not allowed to ever chair a board. I remember the, the hubbub when I, I was a child. I was, you know, in my younger than 10 when these changes happened at my home church. But the hubbub around all that, what do you mean? Well, you know, maybe we just didn't understand the passages correctly for a long, long time. Um, and, and that does mean that sometimes we have to uh, adapt things a little bit, which can be scary. Um, if you start to say, okay, there are portions of the faith that we, that we understand better now, um, that can, can be scary because then you wonder what else might we have been wrong about. But those, those passages on the fringes, those difficult passages, are typically fairly obscure. And uh, it just re reminds us that each generation has to do the work again um, and, uh, and uh, read the Bible for itself. Okay, so that's the opening gamut. Um, and then I'd like to drop down to halfway down the page. And I know we covered this section last week, where was Adam? And I made the, the case that I think really stands up. Adam is blamed for sin much more aggressively than Eve is blamed for sin. Um, so th this uh, blaming Eve for sin uh, has certainly got us into a lot of trouble over the years in terms of... Uh, uh, gender roles and gender relations. I did look at that though, and I think I want to take a few minutes if you'd open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy 2. Um, not because I really want to talk about this, because I, I remember at one point Sue Schultz asked me about it, and I'm not sure I, we ever addressed uh, the passage. So um, we should look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 which is one of those very difficult passages about gender roles. Um, so we'll, we'll pick it up in verse 9, uh, which picks up with gender roles. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Um, so you, you cast about for an analogy of that part, what might have been happening in Ephesus. Um, and we all know that, that there are certain clothes that are appropriate for certain places. Um, and, and I'm looking at, an, no offense, but a more experienced generation of churchgoers. Um, and I'm going to guess as I'm looking at the guys in the room that there was a day when you wouldn't have come to church without a jacket on. Or, or without a tie, for sure. That was just how it was. And it's been difficult probably to adjust to seeing that uh, most men do not wear a tie or a jacket. Um, in many cases, we can't get our ushers to wear pants. Uh, they've got shorts on, but you know. Um, so, th so things have changed. Um, what seems to, and that, that's changed around, around the world. Um, I used to deal with uh, 
deal with guys who worked in the upper managements of GM. Um, and one fellow said that you could always tell when the company was doing well because the dress code relaxed. But when the company wasn't doing well, guys started to dress the part more often because they had to protect their jobs. And um, they, they said the same thing about salesmen, um, that salesmen always came in a little bit more dressed up because they wanted to make the right impression. Um, so, so the world's own um, patterns of, of, of appropriate dress have changed. But what I think we can all agree on is, you know, we're coming into awards show season, um, and you'll have uh, the uh, SAG Awards coming up, and the Golden Globe is coming up, and the Oscars are coming up here. Um, and what we can all agree on is that no one wears a red carpet gown to church. That's good. Right? No one, no one wears that kind of gown. It's not the right place for it. And even though we might maybe mourn the loss of some formality in the way that men dress, no one ever wore a tuxedo to church either. It's not that kind of event. And that seems to be sort of what Paul is driving at um, in verses uh, 9 and 10 when he's talking about propriety and, and not with expensive clothes. Uh, apparently there was an issue with some of the women in the Ephesian congregation. Uh, I think the assumption is that Timothy is working in Ephesus when this letter is written. Um, that some of the Ephesian women were sort of putting on those sorts of airs and uh, it wasn't a good thing. Uh, and from there he goes on into verse 11 which starts to make women's hands sweat. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And then follows the, the, the pertinent point for Genesis. For Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Um, so we're, gonna, we're holding off on verse 15 because that's the one that's really going to make everybody flip out. This is one of those classic places that, that we've gone to that says this is one of those places that restricts the formal teaching office of the church to, to men. Um, and I think that that's probably what, what's going on here. I don't think it's necessarily a universal command to, um, that women should never have any voice at all. But uh, with verse 12, uh, teaching with authority um, over a man seems to be a way of speaking about the, the pastoral office. I don't particularly think that's in doubt. I think the church has been pretty clear on that until the 20th century that the pastoral office is, is reserved for men. Uh, one of the things you also have to say about that is it's not simply the fact of having a penis that qualifies you to be a pastor. Um, later in, in 1 Timothy, Paul is going to exclude all kinds of men from the pastoral office. Uh, you can look ahead to chapter 3. Um, there in the NIV the word is translated overseer, um, which is kind of a just a literal translation of the word. Um, also comes across into English as bishop. Um, but he is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, so, so no, no tomcats in the pastoral ministry, temperate, self-controlled, respectful, hospitable, apt to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, um, one who manages his own household well, um, not a new convert. So there are all sorts of exclusions for who can be a pastor. Um, I think that's an important thing to say as well. Yes, it's reserved for men, um, but not every man. Just because you have a Y chromosome doesn't automatically mean, oh, you can be a pastor. Um, because there are lots of men who are jerks <laughs> and they shouldn't be pastors. Um, and uh, lots of men who are hound dogs and they shouldn't be pastors. And lots of men who have violent tempers and they shouldn't be pastors. Um, so it is interesting that there is a ton of character qualifications as well. Um, so, so this is, I think, verses 11 and 12 are really about the pastoral office. Uh, then there's some real debate about verses 13 and 14 about whether Paul is making a case about more than the pastoral office. Um, several years ago, probably, oh gosh, 10, 15, 20 years ago now, um, our own denomination put out, uh, our Commission on Theology and Church Relations put out uh, a document on, on male-female relationships and um, 
basically, I think, came to the conclusion that that this argument did not sort of apply generally to men and women, but especially to the pastoral office. And there was a well-publicized minority report. It doesn't happen in, in our synod very often. Uh, generally, when our, our Commission on Theology and Church Relations speaks, everyone's on board with the report. But in this case, there was a significant minority that wanted to issue a counter-report, a minority report, uh, to argue that no, um, this order of creation applies even more broadly than just the pastoral office. Um, I guess I tend to lean the other way, that this is about the pastoral office and not generally about male-female relationships, but that's, that's a whole different argument. Um, I, I think one of the things you have to do with like verse 14, well, 13 and 14, uh, Adam was not the one deceived, is you have to allow Paul some space to make a point. That, that, that he's making a, just a general point about the sort of surface reading of, um, of Genesis 3. It's certainly not that he's ignorant of the full text of Genesis 3. Because the man knows his Bible backwards and forwards, and he clearly knows that Adam was standing right there. And I think probably it's the reason that if you read the fullness of Paul's letters, you find out that Paul is much more likely to blame Adam. I mean, Romans is like his flagship letter. And who is to blame in Romans 5? Adam. Adam fell. Um, <clears throat> so, again, this is one of those places where we have to sort of hold the entire scripture together and not let one verse sort of um, outweigh everything else to, to its detriment. So, um, a call for understanding the right place, so no, no ostentation, no, uh, no showing off um, with, with clothes and hairstyles and everything. You're not on the red carpet. Um, includes the, uh, the restriction of the pastoral office to men, and then he uses this, this sort of surface reading of Genesis 3 to make, it, make his point, because um, Eve is the one who is in conversation with the serpent. Um, so he makes his point. Um, he's not denying that Adam sinned, and he's not denying that Adam became a sinner. He's just, he's just sort of you know, using the story for a, a particular kind of point. And I think we have to let him have the space for that, especially considering that in two of his major letters, Romans and 1 Corinthians, it's all about Adam. All right, so, so this, these are difficult passages that we're working through here, and it doesn't get any more difficult than verse 15, but uh, women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness <clears throat> with propriety. What in the world does that mean? Um, well, first of all, it's important to sort of understand what's going on here. Uh, what does your Bible say? I've got a, uh, the 2011 NIV. What does your Bible say for verse 15? Anybody? But, my, but woman, woman will be saved through childbearing. Woman or woman? Women. 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 Okay. Women. All right. If they continue in faith, love, and holiness. Okay, so they didn't change the translation at all. In verse 15, do you see the little footnote next to women? Yes. Okay, and you see what it says in the bottom? In the Greek, she. So in the Greek, it's a singular. Uh, this adds a lot, another level of complexity. So. Um, NIV has chosen one particular possible translation, but they may have made a choice that's not the best in the world. Um, she will be saved through childbearing. Um, and then the, the last half of the verse is in the plural, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness. So there's some ambiguity here. Um, I guess one of the things to say about a passage like this is that a basic principle of biblical interpretation is let the clearer passages interpret the harder passages. And this is a harder passage. Uh, the grammar is difficult. Uh, the thrust of it is difficult. And at the end of the day, if we just come and we sort of throw our hands up in the air and say, I don't know what it means, that's fine. There are those places in the Bible that that happens where you just say, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Um, it's that way in English. Um, at least in English, you've had someone try to make the decisions for you. It's certainly that way in Greek, and it's even more that way in Hebrew. Sometimes you just look at it and say, I don't know what's going on here. It's, it's, it's the exception. Um, so, 
Some possibilities that are on tap for this would include uh, the three that are, if you have a, a Concordia Study Bible, there, there's a nice little note there that kind of explains the three possible options here. And um, it's a pretty good, a pretty good listing. Um, on the one hand, um, it could speak of godly women finding fulfillment in their role as wife and mother in the home. Possible. Two, it refers to women being saved spiritually through the most significant birth of all, the incarnation of Christ. Um, that one appeals to me the most because it, in my mind, it, it really takes the whole thing back to Genesis 3, and we'll talk about that in a minute here. But Genesis 3.15 is where uh, uh, Moses uh, records the statement um, of, of the, pr the promise, right? Um, there will be enmity between his seed and your seed, so that it is through the line of Eve and through the, the birth of a human child that eventually salvation is made. So number two kind of, kind of uh, uh, appeals to me. Or it could be, um, it refers to women being kept physically safe in childbirth. Outside of the scripture, the word for save that's used here often refers to health. So in the scripture, it's kind of a spiritual thing, but its broader connotation is a physical thing. So that's a possibility as well. And you lay all those possibilities out, and you say, okay, so what does it mean? And the answer is, no one knows. <clears throat> so in the mid-90s, these guys wrote this book, which largely deals with this passage. And in the late mid-90s, these two wrote this book because they disagreed with the conclusions of this book. <laughs> and then in the late 1990s, these guys wrote this book because they didn't agree with either one of them. So what did you read? <laughs> I've read them all, and I'm still confused. And, um, you know, I, I think there are certain things that are clear in this passage. Um, like, for example, in that first passage, I, I think modesty is a good thing. I wish we'd talk about that more often, modesty. I remember having a conversation with my elders at one of my former churches, and um, this, this was a legit, a legit thing. They were really worried about this. Um, there were a number of younger women in the congregation who were just following the styles of the time, and when they came to church, their, their shirts were quite low cut. And the elders like, you know, pastor, We can see everything. <laughs> and, and they're like, how do we ask them to dress more modestly? And my response was very simple. I'm not touching it. <laughs> you guys deal with it somehow um, because I'm not, I'm not going down that road. Yeah. And maybe I should have, but there is something to be said for that, you know, a little modesty. I think that's fairly clear in the first couple of voices, verses. I think it's pretty clear that, um, that Paul is saying that... Um, that the pastoral office is reserved for men. Um, I think there's a lot more you can say about that, about the other roles that women fill in the church that's not addressed here. Um, but I think that's pretty clear. Um, I think it's fairly clear that, that Paul's statement in verses 13 and 14 about the order of creation is not his exhaustive teaching on men and women because we both, we've all read Romans. Um, so a lot of this stuff is fairly straightforward. And if the last one gives us a little bit of heartburn, it's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, it makes complete sense that he would say, listen, women have other roles besides desiring the pastoral role. And that might be what he's saying about childbearing and motherhood. Um, it's actually, a, a, I think, been a useful way to try to get at least kids to think about why women aren't supposed to be pastors. And uh, I'll almost always have one young lady who asks, why can't women be pastors? And I'll ask this question, why can't I be a mother? And they're like, well, duh, because you're, <laughs> you're a man, not a woman. I'm like, well, there it is. Um, and I don't know about the rest of the guys in the room, but I'll tell you, um, I don't want to say jealous or not, but, but Sue and I had a much different experience of bringing life into the world. I mean, she could feel life growing within her. And she'd be like, you know, do you feel the baby kicking? Do you feel like, 
okay, yes, I can, but, but she felt it all the time. It was so much an innate part of her experience. Um, in some ways, it, it feels almost unfair how little role I had in bringing life into the world. Um, but it's because I'm a man, not a woman, and, and that, that's all there is to it. Um, so, you know, th these things are fairly straightforward. Um, and if, if you want to understand that Paul is saying women have other blessings besides the pastoral office, especially motherhood, I'm okay with that. Um, I had a professor who, uh, who certainly thought that Eve um, and Mary, there was like this direct line between Eve and Mary and mothers today. And that um, especially Mary then uh, became the one who sanctified motherhood because it was through a, a, the virgin's womb that the Savior came into the world. And I mean, he would just, you know, talk poetic about this kind of stuff. It just really moved him to think of that. Um, the only one of those options I don't particularly care for is the idea that women will be kept safe through childbearing. Um, I think that feels an awful lot like punting on third down. You, know, you, you had one more crack at it, you took the easy route. If you use the word safe rather than safe, because to me this excluded people, women who did not have children. But women will be saved through childbearing. Yeah. And that, that was my, like... Sure, sure. Okay, I get that. Uh, so, so Sue's concern is that saved through childbearing, what about women who never bear children? You know, it seems to exclude them. So... Maybe the thing to see here is what we're really struggling with is, is the verb saved, and what does that mean? Um, so if we use saved in its usual New Testament sense, then I think you, you come especially to Mary, that, th that is through this particular childbirth that, that all humanity is saved. Um, so I, I think you know, that, that maybe is, is best at that point. Um, that made me think of Sarah, because it took her so long to have a child. Mm -hmm. She was still full of faith, love, and holiness. She never gave up on her faith or her hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so again, the, the point is, is <laughs> let, let's, let's, let's put the whole 20-minute conversation together, shall we? Um, we have to honor the scripture. We have to, we have to, every generation has to read it anew and afresh. Not because you're going to discover something that was wrong before, but because you have to do the work for yourself. Um, it, it means more when you do the work for yourself. Um, and that means that sometimes you're going to bump into places that are hard and a new evidence might emerge that would that would help you understand it better. And that's certainly the case here. We, we've excavated Ephesus. We understand Ephesus, the culture that this was written in a lot better. Um, and then sometimes you just have to say there are verses that we're not entirely sure about. The mysteries of God. Yeah. Uh, some of them are, are just, just mysteries. I have a cartoon on my, on my, uh, my wall that I've had ever since graduate school. It's a grandfather with his grandson on his lap. And he says, Johnny, that's an excellent question. They're sitting in his library. He says, you could read all of these books and never find an answer. But by the time you were done, you would have learned to live with the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think sometimes that just is what we have to say. We have to learn how to live with the questions. Um, so I don't think there's anything, uh, I, think, I think you can hold both interpretations together with verse 15, um, that women do find a different kind of uh, meaning in their lives through motherhood than, than they would through the pastoral office, uh, which is predominantly given a fatherhood kind of metaphor. Um, and that, that Mary has certainly sanctified childbearing um, because she brought forth the Savior of the world. I think you can hold those two things together and say, beyond that, I'm not really sure what else to say. It's going to be one of those hard passages. Well, just so it doesn't exclude women who can't have children. I don't think, it, I don't think yeah. anybody's ever taken it that way. Okay. I hope no one's ever taken it that way. Um, <clears throat> well, it just does. <laughs> because it's about the opening gamut of the serpent and how you honor the word of God and the order of creation is certainly on play in Genesis 2 and 3. So you have to let other parts of scripture interpret the parts that you're working on. You have to go, you have to go into the field a little bit. So, any, any thoughts on that before we do actually get back to Genesis 3? I think it's
it's important they have to understand that, again, this is Scripture interpreting Scripture, and the, these verses are going to be always interconnected. Well, Pastor, yes, Peter. Just actually, going back to where this, all, this whole conversation began in the beginning, where you brought up the point, uh, one that sort of jumped out at me was uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that. Right. Yes. And I and I think back to things that uh, I, I'm not sure even specifically why that jumped out specifically, but the point is that when people say things like that, I don't know that they're honestly thinking, I know if I really go into it, I'll find it in the Bible. I don't think they're thinking that's not the way they're portraying it. And my, my point is that there are people that spend, uh, scholars, they spend their whole adult life studying nothing but the Old Testament as an example. Mm -hmm. I mean, they may spend 30, 40 years in the sure. uh -huh. and still could be asked a question about the Old Testament and they would say, you know, I'm not really sure about that. I, I could get you a lot closer to the answer than you'll ever get. But at the same time, as you pointed out yourself, four or five books were written on one particular subject, and they still couldn't come to a conclusion. You said you read them all, and you still are not totally. Mm -hmm. So when things like that do occur, or uh, I, I can think of another possible example of a, a, a really bad accident, a person comes out of and says, Thank God for my guardian angel because I never would have made it through. The, I should have died. Mm -hmm. Except for my, well, wherever are you going to find that in the Bible that says that a guardian angel probably saved you from that terrible accident? So, so, so what, I, what, I, what I'm attempting to say, I guess, is I don't know why I wouldn't go right straight to the root of it, but the point is that when people do say things, they're not always thinking in terms of, I know it. I, I said that. Now, I'm going to show you where I came, what, why I said that. I couldn't begin to tell you what I came up with that, that idea. And at the same time, I'll say, let's say my son has been convicted of stealing 15 times or something. Well, I sure hate the sin that, you know, that these things that he's doing, but he's my son. Mm -hmm. I still love him. You know, love the, love the sinner, hate the sin. Uh, and that's how I would, you know, how I would come to that. Right, and and that that's fair enough, Pete. Um, and like I said, maybe maybe the, with that one, maybe the underlying sense is is, is okay. Um, but um, how is the judge going to punish your sin for stealing fifteen times? In today's world. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying you know he, get away with it. He's he's. That. He's going to send the sinner yeah. to jail, yeah, exactly. right? right. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, love the sinner, hate the sin is fine in the sense that um, it, it's God's to judge, right? I, I get that. Uh, so I, I understand the sentiment. Um, I worry sometimes when we use that kind of language blithely to act as if God's not going to punish the sinner. Because because there's there's no sin apart from a sinner. It's not an abstract concept. It, it's something that real people do. Um, and and to, yeah, no, no, no. It was a good example. And, and to your larger point that most people don't think it through this way, um, it, it's why I, I bring it up. It's I think it's really important that we learn to think it through this way. Um, otherwise, our faith isn't really a biblical faith. It's a faith based on folk wisdom, slogans, superstition, whatever it is. Um, so, the, the guardian angel thing. Okay, there's, there's a passage in Matthew, and I forget what it is exactly, which maybe talks about guardian angels, maybe. It's possible, you know? Well, I, I can't right now, but I've got a concordance and I could find it eventually. Um, so, maybe the idea of guardian angel is fine, the thing I wonder about is, why are we so quick to say my guardian angel and so slow to simply say God? 
If God occasionally works through his angels, that's fine, but ultimately, who saved me in that crash? God did. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my worry with, with the angel thing, and these are all relatively minor points, but you put them all together, and you have people who are woefully misinformed about what the scripture actually teaches. You know, my point with angels is, is that the way that we sometimes talk about angels ends up being a great deal like the Roman Catholics talk about saints, and ends up being a great deal like pagans talked about their 6,000 gods. Every god responsible for protecting you from something else. And it, I don't know, why don't we just say, God did that. God saved me. There's nothing wrong with saying a guardian angel did, I suppose. Right. Mm -hmm. The patron saint of travel. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it just it just becomes a little silly to me at some point. Um, and, and the larger point is that we do have a responsibility as God's people to listen to God's words, and and therefore to to come to the Scripture afresh all the time. Um, I've been look, looking back through old notes. Um, Ah, this is probably the fifth or sixth time I've taught Genesis 1 through 1 through 11 and done in-depth studies on it. Um, it. It's still always good to come back fresh. You know, Sue's always like, why don't you just grab your old notes? Because there's always something new to discover and to see. So, anyhow. <clears throat> all right. That's all introduction. And now it's quarter after. And Anne's got her hand up. And we're not going to get any farther in Genesis 3. Go ahead, Anne, please. When we um, bought our home in yeah. Mantuac, the owner told us that she had buried it um, in the garden. I don't know which saint. Or whatever statue was to help you sell your house. Okay. And so she buried it in the flower garden. And I talked to her later, and she asked me if I ever found it, and if I could give it back to her, and I never found it. But I just thought that was the most bizarre thing I'd ever heard of. <laughs> I thought, if I be finding stuff with anything, I would pray directly to God and not bury a piece of plastic around. <laughs> right, and, and you see the way that, that superstition creeps in, yeah. even to pious talk. Yeah. That, that's the thing I, I see. You, you see the way that superstition creeps in, even to pious talk. And, and so it's important to keep on evaluating everything that we think and believe against what the Bible actually says. So, that's why I have a job. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so, sin. Sin happens. They eat. It's bad. It's not bad immediately. All we know is verse, Genesis 3, verse 7 then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So now they have knowledge they didn't have before. They were promised knowledge they didn't have before. They got knowledge they didn't have before. Uh, and they were naked, uh, and they hadn't known it before. So they, they, they realized they were naked. And the first thing they do is cover the nakedness up. You, you see that in the end of verse 7 there? So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <coughs> They, they hide themselves from each other. So here's, here's one of the first effects of sin, that they are hiding from each other. Um, <clears throat> they're embarrassed at their nakedness. They feel exposed in a way they hadn't felt exposed before. They have a sense of shame that wasn't there before. Um, <clears throat> not that I think, you know, in, in the new age we're all going to walk around naked, <laughs> necessarily. Um, but I think here it's, it's, it's a clear statement. Uh, what they had shared completely and fully is, is now marred. Um, there, there's a, a wonderful song, not a wonderful, but a 
powerful song by Billy Joel, of all people, uh, back when he was making good music in the 70s. <clears throat> a lot of his later music's just kind of garbage. I don't know if you guys know that or not, if you're Billy Joel fans. But way back at the beginning of his career, um, he, he wrote a, a song called The Stranger. And <clears throat> it talked about the various kind of masks that we use to hide various aspects of ourselves from even those who are closest to us. And you think about the way that, that shame um, really keeps things hidden. Um, so after my father died, <clears throat> this is uh, mid-80s, my mom told me that Grandma Stowe, there's 13 of them in that family, Grandma Stowe had those kids by two different husbands because Grandma Stowe had been divorced. Nobody said that aloud in that family, ever. They simply didn't say it. <clears throat> Shame. You know, honestly, my Grandma Stowe was gone by the time I was seven. I hardly knew the woman. It didn't matter to me one lick that she had been divorced. And, you know, I didn't understand what the big deal was, but my dad's brothers and sisters did not talk about it. And I think we can probably all find stories where there is some skeleton in the closet in the family. And this is part of the effect of sin. <clears throat> We're ashamed, and therefore we hide. <clears throat> um, and this happens between parents and children, it happens between siblings, it happens between husbands and wives. No matter how intimate the relationship, there are parts of ourselves that we keep for ourselves. <clears throat> and that's part of the fallenness of sin. Um, other effects of sin then are uh, there in verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, um, which incidentally I believe is where the imagery of in the garden comes from, just so you're in case you're curious. And they, here it says it explicitly, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Apparently their new knowledge didn't extend to the fact that they couldn't really hide from God, but they tried. Um, and the Lord calls out, where are you? And <clears throat> heard you in the garden, and I was naked, and I was afraid. And I love what God asks. Who told you you were naked? <laughs> Where did you come by that particular piece of knowledge? And he knows exactly what's happening, so um, have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? So the brokenness of, of human relationships, the brokenness of humans and God, God still knows all about us. We don't anymore know all about God. And there are parts of ourselves that we would just as soon hide from God as well. Interesting in the Psalms, um, <clears throat> how uh, there's, there's this language of, you know, in the night and in the dark and sort of this, this sort of sense of, of trying to keep things from God, but, but he searches it out anyhow. <clears throat> uh, and it's exacerbated even more, <clears throat> excuse me, in verses uh, 12 and 13. Um, so God is addressing himself to the man, and the man says, the woman you put here, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. So, again, the brokenness. You see what he did there? Mm -hmm. Completely thrown under the bus. He was standing there the whole time, but it's the woman's fault. Look what she did. And, and then the woman does the same thing, and she throws the serpent under the bus. Um, but, uh, <laughs> well, you notice that the Lord doesn't give him a chance to explain himself. Um, so he gives Adam a chance to explain himself. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree I commanded? He chooses to shift blame. He address, God addresses the woman. He gives her a chance to explain herself. She shifts blame. No one is accepting anything around here. So no one is taking the responsibility for what just happened. Um, the only piece of good news is that God doesn't give the serpent a chance to explain. Um, he's just caught dead to rights. So the Lord's response to the serpent is, because you've done this, we're not, we're not asking anymore, now we're telling. Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. Um, did snakes not crawl before this? I don't know. I was going to ask you that. You know, I don't know. I, I heard somebody once uh, trying to say that on the basis of snake anatomy, you could see a place where they might have had legs at one time. And I just think to myself, maybe... 
I don't know. Maybe it's, it's just a symbolic kind of thing because we all know the serpent's not just a serpent. So, um, you know, may, maybe it's just a symbolic kind of thing and the point is, you know, eating dust and just being really put down and people are going to hate you. I mean, does anybody really love snakes? Really? I'm sure there must be somebody someplace. I read some. You know, but even like, remember Marlon Perkins back in the day? Yeah. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? He always sent Jim to get the snakes. Did you notice that? It, it was always Jim out there wrestling the snake and getting eaten by the boa constrictor. <laughs> Never Marlon, you know? Marlon's this world famous herpologist. He's got a building named after him at the St. Louis Zoo, but now he sent Jim in to do the dirty work. No one really loves snakes. Uh, they're just creepy and they move wrong. Um, Verse 15 is uh, what we call the, the proto-gospel, the proto-evangelion, um, the, the first promise of salvation. So the serpent is cursed, and God will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. Um, how in the world the serpent has seed, how in the world Satan has seed, offspring, I have no idea what that means. That's one of those places you just have to throw your hands up and say, I don't know. Um, but Paul grabs onto the idea of the woman's seed um, in Galatians, and he actually makes a big deal about it. He says, uh, actually, I think that the language is repeated about a Abraham too, and Paul is actually arguing about Abraham. I'd have to go back and check Galatians. Um, but Paul makes a big deal. Hey, you know what? It's a singular. It's not seeds. It's seed. And therefore, it's looking to one offspring, and therefore, it's looking to Jesus, and that's the fulfillment of the whole thing. Uh, so that's verse 15, as Paul understands it. And um, one interesting thing at the end of verse 15 is uh, the, the verb in those last two lines is the same. Um, he will strike your head, you will strike his heel. Um, so it's not different kinds of verbs. The violence in the verbs are the same. Um, what's different is that you can survive an Achilles injury. <laughs> um, you can live for a long time on a bad foot. Um, a head blow, a little more dangerous. Mine says crush your head. Right. Your right, and, and most of the English versions do that, but it is in Hebrew the same ver verb for the violence. Um, the, the difference is in the, the organ that's getting struck or crushed. Um, on the one hand, um, it, it's sort of minimizing the injury to Jesus, but it is completely devastating uh, to the serpent. Um, interesting to think about <clears throat> what Satan thought had happened on Good Friday. This is, this is pure speculation. There's no Bible passage this way. But, you know, he had been working to get rid of Jesus for a long time. Did he understand this as a victory? Or did he understand the cross as absolute defeat, that he couldn't deter Jesus away from the cross? Um, but at some point, there had to come this dawning moment that realized, I'm in deep trouble here. <laughs> at some point, Satan had to realize, that this is not going to go well for me. I'm not going to turn this, this man aside. So with the serpent, you have the cursing of, of the, 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 the serpent and the promise of a savior. Uh, it's embedded there, the first, the first promise of the Savior. Um, the woman has the curse fall on her ability about... The woman's curse really falls around the idea of family. Um, I'll make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you'll give birth to children. Some commentators see this as obviously meaning that childbirth is painful which I don't have any experience of, but I'm guessing is true. Um, I was in the room with my wife three times, and um, I'm lucky to have escaped with my life. So it is very painful. Um, I get that. Others talk about you know, the, the, maybe the, the, the climax being in the third part of the verse, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Um, the desire there is, is widely understood to be a desire to rule so you will desire basically to rule over your husband, but he will rule over you. So this is part of the disordering uh, that happens when, when sin falls into the world. Um, disordered humans um, have disordered relationships, and um, we always jockey for power, we always jockey for control. Um, 
and uh, and there, there are always these sorts of games that get played. <clears throat> so perhaps the pain of childbirth is the pain of knowing that they are bringing children into a fallen world. Um, either way, I, I think is is probably a fine way to understand it. Um, certainly, you you worry about the world more when you have children than you did before you had children. You think that's safe to say? Um, I don't know, we, we never worried about keeping cabinets shut and having dangerous chemicals under the sink until the kids started toddling. And then suddenly, oh my gosh, the world is dangerous. Um, really dangerous. So, um, whatever you do with the curse on the woman. Uh, and then a disordered world. When it comes to Adam, it, so if the, the curse on the woman is about disordering in families, the curse on the man is, is a curse on the world. Because you listened to your wife and because you ate from the fruit of the tree, about which I told you don't eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. Um, and now the, the earth itself is going to resist Adam's um, efforts to bring a, pain, a, a living from it. Through painful toil, you'll eat food from it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. So this, this garden that was so full of life, that teemed with life, that wanted to provide everything that, that humans needed for their survival and for their, their benefit, um, now is changed into a world that resists their efforts to bring a, a living out of it. Um, we're not experienced gardeners, my wife and I. Um, we, we gave up on a garden after about three seasons because honestly, it's hard. You guys ever garden? It's hard. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I had a pumpkin patch for the kids one year just because they wanted big pumpkins. So he's all right, we'll grow, grow some pumpkins. Man, alive. Crabgrass everywhere. And that stuff has roots that goes down to kingdom come. You just keep chasing and chasing it no matter what you do. Um, and then you say, I'm going to show you. I'm going to get the roundup out. And then you kill the pumpkins too. And gardening's hard. Right? That's why we go to the Piggly Wiggly because it's right there. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the final curse. Um, you're going to do this until you return to the ground. Dust you are and a dust you will return. So that goes back to the account of, of Adam's creation. Verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she'd become the, the mother of all the living. And in Hebrew, Eve sounds a little bit like the word for living. Um, but notice Adam named his wife. In Genesis 2, he named all the critters because he had dominion over them. He was, he was their, their custodian. He watched over them. Um, Eve is only the woman until right here. And now this also is part of that, that, that disordering because now he's named her. And, and now he, he has sort of asserted his dominance over her. Verse 21, the Lord uh, replaces their, their clothes of fig leaves with uh, animal skin. Some guys want to read that and say, see, that's the first animal sacrifice. I don't know. I think what God is doing there is saying, you know what, you guys did this and I got to live with it. And you're going to need something more permanent than, uh, than a fig leaf. You're going to need to get covered with leather. It's going to last uh, because you're going to have to live with this. And then he is banished uh, from the garden. The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, um, but he only learned it through experience. Um, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. It, it, I wonder a little bit if Adam had been allowed to eat from the tree of life, if that would have been a way of saying he's just going to have to live with his sin forever. But by banishing him, uh, there is maybe a hint that, that this curse is not going to last forever. And then Genesis, uh, excuse me, Revelation 22, uh, there'll be a tree of life uh, when all things are restored and, uh, and made new. And the, flaming, uh, the cherubim and the flaming sword uh, stay out. So banishment from the presence of God. We've talked about that before. All right, that's an hour and five minutes. You guys got more than your money's worth today. Any last comments or questions before we break this thing up? Wasn't the tree of life, if they ate from that, they couldn't eat from that because then they'd become like God or something? 
You know, it, it almost feels, Sue, like if they ate from the tree of life, they would be consigned to be these fallen people. Uh, but by being banished from that, they had, to, they had to receive eternal life some other way. And that's the route of redemption. So that, so that life would have been the easy way they had to do that. The tree of life would have given up on them. They'll live like this, and that's just how they're going to be. But by denying them that, that eternal life, there is now the possibility that God's promise of, of one who will crush the serpent's head can be brought to f fulfillment. Anybody else? All right, let's close with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, so much to think about today. And we pray that as we walk uh, away uh, this, this morning, we, we might think uh, deeply about how it is that we handle and address ourselves to your word. And that we would also think about how devastating the effects of sin have been, not only in our relationship with you, but our relationships with one another as well. Uh, grant us this insight and then hold us in hope uh, that indeed you kept your promise and brought our Lord Jesus Christ, who healed that grievous injury. These things we pray in his name. Amen.